Could you pay zero tax while being resident in Portugal? Maybe. We're going to discuss today the most mis no, not mis misunderstood, but one of the most interesting and often misunderstood tax programs in the world, the Portuguese non-habitual residency regime. Everyone, I am Michael from Offshore Citizen, and today we're going to be excited to go over how exactly this NHR program is called works. Now, before we do that, if you have not already, please hit the subscribe button, click the notification bell, to make sure you don't miss out on any of our future videos. We try to produce great content for you every day. If you've got anything you'd like to see, put it in the comments. If you're at all interested in these subjects of how to pay the lowest legal amount of tax possible, international structuring, international tax planning, uh, asset protection, residencies, citizenships, opening bank accounts, setting up companies, reach out to me, book a call, clarity.fm forward slash Michael Rosmer, link below, or check out our websites, offshorecitizen.net, offshorecapitalist.com. Well, let's get into it. Okay, so uh, the non-habitual residency program in Portugal is a program we really like, mainly because of the fact that it is uh, in a country that a lot of people would actually like to live in, right? So unfortunately, a lot of the programs that are most attractive are in places that there's just not that many people want to go live there, right? And so, you know, you're often doing this trade-off. You're like, hey, you know, I'd love to live in the U.S., but the U.S. has horrible taxes. But on the other hand, do I want to go live in Georgia? Uh, maybe I don't, right? And so that sort of trade-off is there's kind of a balance point in Portugal, which a lot of people uh, really like, right? So in 2009, they created something called the Non-Habitual Residency Program. The way that it works is you have to have not been resident there for five years, prior to this, which interestingly, this means that Portuguese citizens who have moved away and then moved back can take advantage of it. It's a program that lasts for 10 years, meaning that the tax benefits I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, are good for a 10 year period after which you go to being a normal Portuguese resident and you pay normal tax. So either you know, you're know you gonna pay the normal tax or you're gonna leave, we'll see what happens. Uh, this program has certainly helped along with their golden visas and some of their other programs to bring quite a few people to Portugal it's made it kind of a dynamic place for entrepreneurs and development, things like this. So that's pretty cool. And uh, yeah, so, so a bunch of people really like it. Now, is this a program under which you can get zero tax? Okay. Uh, yeah, sometimes. Sometimes not. Okay. This is very, very important to realize. So I often run into people, I was talking to somebody just this past week who kind of reached out to me. He's like, hey, great. So I can move to Portugal and pay zero tax. And I'm like, well... Not necessarily. Let's talk about your situation. So today I'm going to go through for you how this works, who it applies to, who it doesn't, and how you structure your business so that you can take advantage of it. It's fairly nuanced. There's like a lot of little exceptions and little gotchas in there. So if you have questions about it, please reach out to us. Again, you can book a call, clarity.fm, forward slash Michael Rosmer, link below, etc. Uh, but yeah, we'll, we'll just start with, I'm going to try and make sense of it for you by first of all separating out two types of income. And this is probably the most paramount piece of understanding around the NHR, okay? That is there is foreign income and there is domestic income, okay? If you're talking about domestic income, you have employment income and then you've got other types of income. Now, other types of income are all gonna be taxable in Portugal, like normal income, okay? Whatever the normal Portuguese tax rates are, you're gonna pay. If you're talking about employment income, there can be an exception, which is there's what we call uh, high value added professions. Okay, if you're in a high value added profession, then you can end up paying 20% tax. Okay, now you may ask, hey, am I one of those people? In my experience, for most of our clients, you can be. Okay, the list is really extensive. There's a lot of uh, a lot of roles. You can say, you know, there's managers, there's executives, there's people in IT, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so, very good chance that you can somehow fit yourself into one of these criteria to say, hey, I'm paying 20% tax. What does this mean for you immediately? It immediately means, hey, if you're somebody who's willing to pay 20% tax, then Portugal, boom, like it can work for you. So long as you wanna live there, et cetera, it's quite easy to get residency. It's really easy to qualify for the NHR. It's like basically you check a box on an online, uh, go, by going online. So it's, it's quite easy. The system is set up really well that way. You could be working towards a citizenship there. Uh, it's gonna last for 10 years. 10 years is a pretty long time, right? So decent. Uh, so that might be good. If you're not somebody who's in that situation, uh, who you want to pay less than 20% tax, well then we have to move over to this other category, right? So let's start with the easiest one, which is pensioners. Pensioners, assuming their pension is coming from a place that 
uh, meet some criteria with tax treaties, uh, et cetera, it's taxed at 10%, okay? It used to be zero. So it used to be, it was famous for people from UK who would come. And basically the way that it works is, although it may not have been subject to tax, meaning it wasn't actually taxed in say UK, uh, it could have been taxed in UK under the tax treaty and therefore Portugal won't tax it and therefore you're good to go. So bottom line is pensioners can often earn 10%, uh, can uh, receive their pensions at a 10% tax rate, which is pretty reasonable. It's not quite as good as Greece with their 7% regime, but maybe you'd rather live in Portugal than you would in Greece. Uh, certainly better path to citizenship in Portugal. So, you know, worth considering, right? Let's go to the other side of the spectrum. The other side of the spectrum is we can say, all right, uh, how about if you are somebody who's running an online business, okay? If you're running an online business, it's a little bit more complicated. Why? Because usually you're like a key person in the company. I had an earlier, I called with somebody earlier today and it wasn't in Portugal, but we were talking about, you know, they have this online business, they're selling uh, digital courses, cool, great, you know, doing well, smart marketer. So what's the problem here? The problem is that person is an instrumental player in the company, okay, very, very important to the function of that company. And they're sitting in the country doing the work, right? So if you're sitting in Portugal and you are doing the work, Portuguese source income doesn't apply. Like you don't, you don't get the favorable tax treatment here. So you've got a few problems that can come into place immediately. Number one is potentially management and control rules could deem your foreign company resident in Portugal. Okay, and then, you know, all goes at the window because it's a Portuguese resident company. So that's the first thing you need to watch out for. The second thing you would need to watch out for is you, by merit of the role that you're playing, could constitute a permanent establishment, and therefore the income attributable to you would be Portuguese source income and subject to Portuguese tax. Okay, so that's the next thing that can get into your, your issue. Now, let's flip, at, look at it the other side. Maybe you're like, okay, great. Well, the company is, I can avoid those things, and the company is gonna be in a situation where it's gonna make money and it's gonna pay me money. Okay, great. Can I be zero tax? Yeah, potentially you can. But here's the caveat. It doesn't work, sort of, uh, from, and this is where I, I'm saying sort of because this is where it gets like a little bit finicky and, uh, and you'll get different lawyers will tell you different stories and the truth is that none of them are, they're all just opinions, okay? So we're gonna kind of separate fact from fiction here. So if your company is from a country that qualifies, which loosely means it's not on the blacklist, okay, then you should be able to receive those dividends tax-free. Now, what's the problem? The problem is Portugal has a super extensive blacklist of countries, okay? Like virtually every place. So here's an example. Every zero tax country automatically blacklisted. Labuan blacklisted. Hong Kong blacklisted. You know, et cetera, et cetera, right? Uh, it actually gets even more complicated than this when you start getting into somehow there's some of their CFC rules work and their like tax thresholds and things like this. But that's why I'm saying, if you have questions about that, if you're considering going, reach out to me, we'll have a conversation about it and I'll go through exactly how it applies in your situation. Um, okay, so let's assume that you aren't on the blacklist then yes, you're probably gonna be good. However, the problem is, usually that means you were taxed in the country that the money's coming from. So, you know, did you gain there? Like for instance, let's say you had a UK limited company. All right, you know, you're paying 19% tax. All right, you saved 1% as compared to just having an earned income in, uh, in Portugal, right? I, I guess you can avoid socials and things like that. So that's kind of good. Maybe you go and you say, hey, listen, I'm, I have a Singapore company. Okay, well, Singapore is not on the blacklist. Singapore has a 17% tax rate uh, and it's graduated up to there. So maybe it works out a little bit less for you. But let's say you paid 17% tax at a Singapore level and you pay, okay, you saved yourself 3% tax. All right. Now, this is where I want to start to get into some of the complications for you. Uh, I have people that I know, uh, clients and friends, et cetera, who have operated through companies that are on the blacklist, uh, Hong Kong in particular, and have gotten away with this, okay? So they receive the dividend, uh, et cetera. Now, in the cases where I've seen that, typically what's happened, typically, not all cases, but typically, uh, they actually are paying tax in Hong Kong, they can qualify under the tax treaty, they do actually have the businesses genuinely outside of the country, et cetera. Uh, the structure was set up before they moved to Portugal. It wasn't set up like, you know, in order to avoid Portuguese tax, et cetera. There's a reasonable case that they might be able to make that they can take that tax-free and qualify. 
And so that's maybe a little bit different than if you're moving to Portugal and then setting up a UAE company and then you know trying to operate it from Portugal but claiming it's UAE and company. You know that's pretty risky, right? Uh, the next scenario is I've seen people use US LLCs. Okay. Now, how is it the deal with the US LLC? Let's assume that we're talking about, hey, you can set up a US LLC, you have no US trade or business, you have no US source income. Basically, there's no tax in the US, okay? So you're like, great, you know? Got my US company, it's, you know, uh, got a, a US tax, a tax treaty with Portugal, great, we're feeling happy about that. You know, take these dividends. Well, so here's the thing. There's no LLCs in Portugal. And there's no case law to tell you how income from LLCs should be taxed in Portugal. So there's a, a chance you can get away with it. Some people do get away with it. There's also a risk associated with it, okay, which is that they will say, well, really, that's not actually a dividend, which comes to the next scenario, which I've seen, which is, I had somebody ask recently, they said, hey, listen, you know, what about a UK LLP? Well, partnership income is not dividend income in Portugal. Okay, they have Portugal uh, partnerships in Portugal, and so that is going to be subject to Portuguese tax. It's not uh, not treated the same. So, what does that mean? the The risk from the LLC standpoint is that if you were to go to court, they would consider it to be a partnership. Okay, so when I work with people, my philosophy is always this: I always say, let's do things legitimately. Let's set up a legitimate tax structure that is fully compliant, so that Okay, hopefully you don't get audited, hopefully you don't go through all this stuff, etc. But if you do, at least you can show them everything and say, hey, listen, look, I'm 100% compliant and you're good to go. Okay, that is my basic philosophy. And so when we have people who move to Portugal, we build a structure that works so that you know that it's not a problem. Okay, you don't have to worry and say, oh, well, you know, maybe there's a concern here. No, no, like you know that it meets all the rules, you're fine. There's a lot of arguments that people will make that, hey, listen, you know, you're attracting a bunch of Chinese people and Chinese people normally have uh, companies from, uh, from Hong Kong and, you know, Portugal knows where their bread is buttered and so they're not going to actually go after these people, etc. Could all be true. Could all be true. But it's a risk. And so when I'm doing designing structures, I prefer not to take that risk, right? I prefer to say, okay, let's follow the rules. Let's go in deep. Let's pay attention to it and make, make sense of this. So anyway, that's the, uh, that's the story uh, on those. So potentially, yes, you can pay zero tax on dividends, okay? You can also potentially pay ta zero tax on royalties, uh, on capital gains, and foreign sourced interest. So basically, if you're in an investment situation, this is a pretty great visa for you. It works out quite well. If you're, not, if you're in an active business, it could, you know, provided some of these different, different factors associated. So anyway, all of this summed together, can you get 20% tax? Yeah, you absolutely can uh, for almost everybody. Can you potentially get lower if you're a pensioner? Can you potentially get 10% tax? Yeah, absolutely. If you're a business owner, can you get you know close to 0% tax? Yeah, maybe, maybe. Uh, but you need to be really careful about how you structure it because there's a lot of rules who can, uh, they can get in trouble. And some of the lawyers who I deal with from various parts of the world tell me you know their clients have been audited and they've had hassles and things like this. So you know again, I like to plan it properly. Uh, if you're an investor, you know, quite good as well, again, provided that you can make all of this stuff work uh, in terms of it being passive and not active and it's foreign income. So I hope that helps. I hope that gives you some idea. Like I said, if you have questions about it, if you, you know, there's something in particular to your case, reach out to me, claire.fm forward slash Michael Rosmer, book a call, the link below. Uh, definitely smash the subscribe button and the notification bell to get notified on future videos. If you have other questions, put them in the comments. If you've got feedback, if you like the video, please click the like button. Check out our websites, offshorecitizen.net, offshorecapitalist.com. I hope this was really helpful for you, and I'm going to look forward to seeing you guys on the next video.